Welcome to the Healing Health Podcast. I'm Amber Petty. In this episode, I'll be talking to Professor Tracy Bucknell from Deakin University's Institute for Health Transformation. We sat down to discuss her research into how we can make Australian hospitals safer. So join us in the conversation now. Well, Tracy, thank you for taking the time out this morning. It sounds like you've had a very busy morning juggling all parts of your life. I'm looking forward to talking to you about all of your roles and research in medical emergencies and patient safety. This seems to be a subject that's a little bit easier to present to a lay person like me. So thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. (laughs) So I just want to read you a little something and you can tell me whether that's been plucked from nowhere or whether it has some merit. But I read in Australia, 11 million people are admitted to hospital each year. And of those 11 million, one in every 10 patients suffer some kind of harm um, that's not related to why they went into hospital. And a staggering 25% of an Australian study, so I'm doing little Mm -hmm. quotation marks there, um, 25% of those patients ended up permanently disabled. Is this, is is any of that right? That's all statistics from research. Wow. So the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare published a report And from 2016, 2017, there were 11 million hospitalised patients, Mm. hospital admissions. Yeah. So that's where that figure comes from. Okay, yep. The 25% comes from a study that was conducted and published in the 90s. So we're going back quite a while. Yeah. But that study was a replication of of studies in other parts of the world Mm. and the figure came out really consistently across all over the world, 10% of patients. So if you think of the, the, you know, that's more than 1 million patients who are being harmed during their hospitalisation. So, and it's unrelated to their disease. How does that, I mean, that is a staggering amount of people and that the thought that I could be in the quarter of people that go in for whatever it is and and end up permanently disabled, but what what sort of disability and what what am I going in with and potentially coming out with in this sort of... So uh, an example of harm that might occur yeah. is perhaps an elderly patient who's living quite well at home mm. but goes in for some elective surgery. They need a hip replacement. Right. And whilst they're in hospital, they actually have a fall. Yeah. And it might be because they're elderly and they needed to get to the bathroom quickly. Yep. Higher beds uh, or different... Higher beds. Yeah, surroundings. Not on carpeted floor, mm-hmm. in an unknown area, poor lighting... You know, the things that are quite foreign in a hospital environment mm. become actually barriers for Obstacles. people. Mm. So with these sorts of people, you know, they need to go on and have a hip replacement yeah. perhaps because, sorry, or a, some they suffer a fracture from yeah. falling yeah. and need to have some further surgery. Those patients sometimes don't actually, because if they're elderly, they become more um, immobile mm. from having that fall mm-hmm. they may not be able to return home they they might go through a period of going for transitioning to a rehabilitation place but then it may be decided that they're too frail to go home so mm. they'll end up in residential aged care and you know that they might then be always on a, a walker mm. they might always have suffered a shoulder injury perhaps from their fall if they've broken their arm that they just never regain the, mm. their functional, their mobility mm. that they had previously. Okay, so that's, so that's not, the type of permanent disability. So that makes sense that elderly people in environments where it's a, you know that they've, they've suffered something, so they are weakened, um, but they're also not in their own home environment, as you said. You know, lino versus carpet, mm. different things. Would that make up? A fairly large percentage of the 25% because of course you know I've gone into drama mode and thought what like I'm going in for to get my tonsils out and I'm coming out you know with a you know a permanently you know I've broken my mm-hmm. arm and it's permanently you know it's never the same or something mm-hmm. like that you know 
Uh, that does make up a, a number of them, but yeah. there's also other things, and you would have heard of infections, hospital infections. Yes, yes. That's another thing. So these hospital infections can cause um, oh. major breakdowns of wounds. So, for example, you know, even any skin lesion that something, any break in the skin can mm. turn into a major wound in a hospital because of infe- being becoming infected. So I see. There's other things such as pressure injuries, which we used to call bed sores. You've probably yeah, heard yeah. That, that term. Yeah. And bed sores come from people being immobilised and lying in bed and not moving around. And so they get these sores that break down, they get bigger and bigger, they require skin grafts. You can imagine the, mm. the sequelae of things that they need to have further treatments, longer stays, high costs, mm. and they're never the same. They're the sorts of things when we say, okay, uh, you know, permanently disabled. Is it's not the the disabled that you become, you're in a wheelchair or anything, but you become, you have some level of disability because of what's been encountered. Okay, gotcha. That makes sense. Um, okay, so let's. But we do have lesser yeah. things that go on. Yeah. For example, you know, you a, a medical error can be something as common as a medication, a missed medication. So the, the person comes in and they're having treatments mm. and they miss um, particular types of medications because um, someone may have forgotten to give it. Yeah. It may be that they, they could be given the wrong medication. Yes. And, and actually in this series I talked to Martin Hensher about um, his research into um, over-medicating, over-medicating, over-treatment and, of course, the harm that can come through being prescribed something that wasn't right for you mm. and the symptoms that occur from that, which is really fascinating mm. as well. So that also, yes, yeah, so so moving out of the 25% where I've gone, <gasps> you know, people, one in 10 patients suffering from harm in hospital that shouldn't have really happened. So it can be something like that. Mm. I mean, the, the harm can be lesser. Yes. But on average it, it causes a length of stay of... Uh, another seven days the blows for everybody that, that, on average yeah. it does blow out the costs and given that we have a such lot. a shortage of hospital beds we have a backlog of waiting lists for people yeah. wanting elective surgery in public hospitals these types of safety issues yeah. really need addressing and quite often you see them as front page news as a coronial inquest and you see oh, families see. who are you know it's not just the cost the economic cost mm. but it's the the personal costs to families and communities of losing someone or having this sort of error occur yeah yes that it, it's at the, at the higher end it's incredibly traumatizing and uh and obviously costly when especially when it gets through the court systems so let's talk about your research specifically um in the area of medical emergencies and patient safety. So what's the purpose of your research and what is the process of you actually finding the data and information that you need? So I'll give you a little bit of a background yeah. in, in how I got to where we, we yes, have Yes, please. Got. So in these statistics that we've just talked about, yeah. there was a, a key statistic that showed that a lot of patients who were suffering these disabilities or were dying were in hospital at the time and were having um, delayed treatments or delayed diagnoses mm. because they, instead of getting on the trajectory of getting better, mm. they started to deteriorate. And so in that deterioration, you're trying to, you know, the clinical staff, the nurses and the medical staff that are in hospitals are trying to recognise that that change from going in the right direction mm. to going in the wrong direction. Yes. And they're trying they need to be able to recognize when that happens yeah. as early as What's possible. What's the tipping point? Exactly. And so when I started my nursing uh, many many years ago, we used to have to wait for someone who actually stopped breathing to get assistance from the intensive care unit to come down and assist with the patients. Whereas the studies, all the research has been showing that the earlier that it's recognised that these patients have started to go backwards instead mm. of forwards, mm-hmm. that we can actually reverse it and keep them on the same trajectory so they're going to go home in the same time. Right. So 
What we've done now is through a whole lot of measures that are new accreditation standards for hospitals, focusing on patient safety in all the areas that we've already talked about, wow. we've now got standards where we have it mandated that there is a response system in place an organisational response hmm. of different levels so the sicker someone becomes, a different group come in to assist. And by that, I mean, so normally in a hospital you have a medical consultant hmm. and some more junior medical staff yeah. looking after you and the ward nursing staff. Hmm. In the situation when someone really gets to a tipping point where we know that if we let them go any further, they'll mm. end up in intensive care or perhaps even die. Mm. We need to see them, treat them for in, with this really in this time critical point mm. by these external people coming in, usually from in the intensive care unit, to treat them and and prevent them from going, becoming sicker. Mm. When we do that, we know that between 80 and 90% of patients can then stay on the ward. There will still be some that end up going to intensive yep. care, but most can be reversed and stay on the ward. So how does that work, though? So, you know, you've got a busy ward, you know, four patients in a room, you know, the, the normal staff going in and out, mm. the, the, you know, the specialist head doctor coming in like once a day yeah. or every second day or whatever it is, um, and and one or all of those people in the beds are all suffering and, and sort of waiting for their attention. Is it So it's, I would presume, the nurse, nurse, mm. nursing staff that are trained now to recognise what are the cries for help or the changes that they then say, okay, we're now allowed to call in uh, the intensive mm. care nurses Correct. above us. So we used to... Uh, not have that facility. Now we have that facility. There's special numbers that we call and alert the team from intensive care to come yeah. down. So does that mean but we've got more intensive uh, care nurses in the hospital system now? No. Oh, gosh. <laughs> but what we have, we have special staff who are rostered to go to these team, these patients that need to be seen by the medical... It's called an, a medical emergency team. Mm -hmm. And so we, they, they're specialists that are, that are usually rostered to go out and do that. That's not always the case in some hospitals. And mm. you can imagine there's quite a variability from a rural and regional hospital through to a place like the Alfred where I work mm. as a nurse. And, you know, that, that extreme where they've got, um, you know, a bigger intensive care unit, more staff and, mm. and so forth. So from the... Uh, patients that actually deteriorate there are criteria that nurses are looking for yeah what is that what, what so there there um areas every nurse and for years and years forever have been taking vital signs and by vital signs i mean measuring someone's pulse mm -hmm. how they're breathing looking at their temperature measuring their blood pressure so we know that these signs, that if they, we get changes in these signs, mm. we, there's a, a threshold outside the normal range that when they get into that, that we need to assess them further, intervene or refer them on to this team that needs to come in and do a, a um, more critical type of analysis and diagnosis and treatments mm. than what the ward staff have available to them. Mm. So there's definitely different equipment that might be required to mm. get a, a clearer diagnosis, for example, more treatments that may not be able to be given on the ward that have to be given in intensive care. So, But there are criteria, these medical emergency call criteria, mm. and we yeah, work right. within those. And this is what the standards from the Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare have for accrediting hospitals now. We have these criteria put in place. So nurses work within that in their scope of practice mm -hmm. by and by that I mean what they're allowed to do before and what they have to ask for for prescriptions from medical staff you know for perhaps putting in an intravenous line giving for some going up and a, yeah so upping going, so their level of that's treatment exactly yeah. right so they they will do what they can do mm -hmm. and then they'll escalate it to someone else to come in and assist and yeah. be able to make decisions that are different from nursing decisions. Do you know, I realise uh, now that you're speaking that I saw that happen in actually a really 
I don't know whether beautiful is the word, but seamless way was last year when my dad died on Good Friday and so his heart was failing and it, it all happened so quickly. But it went from a situation where I was told um, that he might have uh, three to six months left and then he was dead in four days. Mm-hmm. And what I – what – happened that was interesting because of course I I mean I'm in la la I'm like what is happening I mean it was just I felt like I'd been hit by a truck so I'm not very good with going now what do I need to be looking out for here because I also didn't realize within a 24-hour space of time I didn't realize how much it was escalating so that was all in the hands of the people that you're talking about and and I don't know that they – well, no, they, in 24 hours they realised he probably wouldn't see it through Easter. And so what happened was he was in a, you know, a shared ward, a public ward, and, you know, it just – I'm so busy with, you know, I'm having to tell people to come and sort of say goodbye to, type of thing. And so the ner- normal nursing staff are doing whatever they're doing, but then suddenly um, within a fairly short space of time we were now being taken into a room on our own, which in the scheme of things was a beautiful room because it literally had a very big window and it looked out to um, over the um, Melbourne Exhibition building. And actually on the night that he died it was the most beautiful pink sky it was absolutely extraordinary this is at St Vincent's and this incredible nurse told my whispered in my dad's ear you know um, look out look out the window she moved his whole bed and said look out the window and you know take this take this uh, image on your journey with you it was honestly it was oh my god are you crying (laughs) Oh, it's it on uh, your cry. So, I mm. thought, am I going to tell this story because I, oh, I, I don't want to cry? Yeah. It, her name was Grace. Just to top it all off, this woman, this <laughs> this nurse, she was unbelievable. So, one of the studies we've just completed, mm. we interviewed patients and families after they'd experienced this period of having serious deterioration yes and the medical emergency team coming in to visit them Mm. and we studied this at public and private hospital yeah and what we found was there's uh, patients themselves have a sense of something and it's not impending doom or anything Mm -hmm. like we hear in you know stories and on television but they do feel something's not right. Yes. And that they... Dad kept saying that. That's exactly what Dad just... I mean, he quickly couldn't talk, but leading up to it, he said something's not right. Mm. So that's exactly how people... So what our study has has really shown is that there is... Uh, we have physical symptoms which can be measured by taking vital signs and mm. doing you know things, x-rays and things like that. But there's visceral feelings. Mm. Yeah, explain visceral. Is, so they're the things that are um, – they're not something anyone else can see. Mm-hmm. But you, it's a sense of something, a feeling. Mm-hmm. And those are – family members can have them mm. as well because you know – Which is – there's a connection. It's, I yes, guess it's a – You know the behaviours that your pa- – family member normally does the signs you know, expressions how they, so for people we often hear people are normally stoic um so they won't talk about their pain but yeah. when they do say i'm in severe pain you know that it really is that's right that they way, don't say this, this way is, worse than yeah, normal so yeah. that's the sort of thing and those are the stories so we've um a, i've had a phd student analyzing those stories oh, and wow. looking at what are the things can we learn from those stories in order to perhaps work with family members and patients when they come into hospital and I'll give you an example mm. when you go to the airport and you get on a plane before we take off and go down the runway mm. we have the stewardess or steward doing the safety talk yeah they show you where to get the oxygen mask yep. coming down, where the es- es- uh, exit rows are, mm. and all of that sort of thing. So when we started this study, it was really on the basis of what information could we give patients and families to prepare them when they arrive in hospital, that if they get these 
feelings and things because mm. there's more when and more when someone is really really sick yes when when we know more and more through our research that the earlier that these subtle signs are picked mm. up mm. and that someone then really monitors them very closely mm. the more likely we are to prevent them having that really extreme deterioration and mm. something bad happen and harming someone yes so we do want the patients and the family members to actually express to nursing staff are the ones that are most close to the patient. Yeah. They get to know them, they look after them for a period of time. So you've got tend to have a, a stronger relationship and more of a rapport, mm. but also it's the language as mm. you know we've mentioned earlier about how the translations that nurses do between doctors and patients sometimes. So speaking in lay language, mm. but it's we wanting to to hear what patients and families are feeling in yeah. order to make some decisions about do we need to do further assessments, do we need to intervene in from a nursing practice mm. level, or do we need to what we say is escalate to someone such as a medical practitioner who can prescribe different medications mm. or um, send someone off for x-rays or, or mm. scans or something like that. So those stories are actually, we are recognising now it's more and more important to mm. listen to those stories. Mm. And also giving, um, well, patients, loved ones, permission to be able to sharing those mm. because I think everyone's got a different level of um, when they're in an environment like the hospital, like it's, it's not a competition about who loves their loved one more, but there is definitely, I think, going to be um, different levels of when do I bother the hospital staff because I can see they're looking after this person and this person and you know in the example of my my dad um you know one of the poor young people in the room well was the only young person in the room out of four I think was maybe a heroin addict or something so um looked to be very really really suffering and of course I'm not realizing how much my dad is suffering so there's lots of just little moments where you think thank god St Vincent's nailed it in terms of you know everything that they did but it you know I I did sit back I'm sure and go is that normal that he just vomited up his orange juice like should he be that you know mm. things I like think that I think that's the important part and that's why aeroplanes and the airline industry mm. have done this so well in, in you preparing you know what to expect. Yeah, and just hammering it home yeah. over so and that over was, and over again, yeah. What that was to part expect. of our research yeah. because people expect to be sick in hospital so when they get starting to feel worse, mm. some people just think, well, that's what I'm... I'm here, I've had surgery, of course I'm going to have pain. And it's pain. okay Even because if I'm in... I get more and more pain, yeah. I'm expecting to have pain. Whereas actually what we need to be able to do is talk to them about what it is with pain, for example. You know, when you're, you've had surgery four days earlier, you shouldn't expect to suddenly get a different a type pain. of pain. Right. Or, you know, a pain that was in your, you've had your hip replaced, yeah. but suddenly you've got chest pain. Yes. So yes. we need to know differences. Yes. So part of it is the conversation that an admitting nurse, mm. and by admitting nurse, I mean the nurse who receives the patient when they first come to the ward, mm. has a conversation with the patient and mm. the family members about, you know, you might expect this is the way things go, but sometimes. It doesn't always go that way and we need to know if it's not heading in the right direction mm. and these are the things you might, you know, you, if you experience these, we need to know about. Mm. And then that's, that opens up the conversation and we know from mm. other research that when we give people permission to express their concerns, mm. there's earlier recognition and a, a, a quicker response and then a prevention of harm. Mm. Wow. So what are some of the other kind of areas or aspects of your research that you're showing, you know, that are showing up for you? So we've been working quite closely with how to assist nurses to have this earlier recognition. Mm. And, you know, you, you touched on one of the points about when there's a lot of 
nurses around, but they're all looking really busy. Mm. What do you do? Mm. Mm. And I think that's the point where we have to, uh, you know, have a... And this is why research is so good, because mm. it allows us to reflect on what is going on, look mm. at the... Mm. Analyse the data, see what areas are where we're having delays, where we're not having... De- you know, where things are working well, where they're not working mm. well. And what we do is then target interventions or strategies towards it might be educating staff particularly in an area or it might be giving them more information in order to make decisions Mm. because what we know there's a lot of noise with information now we have nurses are dealing with incomplete information Mm. too much information the the environment of a hospital is so busy so Mm. noisy Mm. Mm. We know patients don't get very much sleep, and it's the same for oh, that's a clinicians part of it. and you know all health professionals all have so much noise going on around them. Yeah. People are being interrupted in their interruptions. You know, yeah. they you, they go to interrupt someone, and someone will interrupt them. Yes, and so yes. and that breaks someone's concentration mm. and decision making. And you know, we are making life and death decisions mm. about whether to intervene in some way or treat some way, someone in, in a way. So if you've got the decision-making sort of broken, that, that concentration broken because of all the things going on around you, mm. then it's really difficult to ensure that the system is fail-safe. Mm. But mm. We're, what we're trying to do is build a fail-safe system. Mm. So we, one of the areas, for instance, we were trying to work out... This is one of the studies. We were looking at all the patients that were discharged from intensive care at the Alfred Hospital, and we studied who of those went on to have these medical emergencies and could we identify them on the discharge from intensive care so they got more support so they didn't end up having these medical emergencies. Meaning they had to come back. Yeah. And having to come back into the intensive care. Yeah. So we were trying to prevent that. So one of... My honours students, who was doing a Bachelor of Nursing, had an IT background Mm. and uh, she was able to link four different databases from within the hospital so we could actually then run some statistical modelling Mm. where we could actually predict who of these patients who, when they are leaving intensive care, are most at risk of having these medical emergencies. Mm. So the system is that then the medical consultants, the ICU consultants... So those that have got special intensive care training actually go and see those patients that are most at risk and then they keep an eye on them so they're they're not going to just tip into that balance of being, you know, deteriorating and not being recognised, but they're being monitored closely. And those that aren't at risk of having this rebound based on the model Mm. can be seen by their regular physicians Mm -hmm. in the wards as they normally would Mm. because it's a workload issue you can't concentrate when you're you know the Alfred intensive care is over 50 beds now in size Mm. you can't physically see that many people and give a really concentrated view if you've already looking after people in the intensive Mm -hmm. care to go out so there's there are you know it's it's a workload issue, but it's making sure that the right people see the see the person at the right time to make the right decisions. Mm. How will you change tomorrow? Design a future beyond your own. Design a future that makes a difference. Deakin's research students are the best and the brightest, with access to global leading researchers, world class facilities, industry partnerships, and innovative research centres, designing cutting edge solutions that make an impact. Become a change maker. Become a Deakin Research student. To discover more, go to deakin.edu.au slash research. Deakin, more than a university. What I'm also interested in with this series, and I think other people listening will be too, is not just literally the research that you do, but what motivates you (laughs) to be in this area. Like there's obviously something about what you do and who you are as a person that is just so passionate and mm. you know about mm. your well, I think area if I think back why I became a nurse yeah you know it was probably people always recognized that I was a caring person mm. so at that stage 
uh, you know, I'm old enough that, uh, you know, the, there were limited opportunities for what, what sort of career path you took. And I did like caring for people. So mm -hmm. I ended up going and doing my hospital training. How old were you when you did that? I started when I was 17. Mm. And that was, you know, I, I had grown up in the country on a farm. I had never seen the likes of the sickness that I saw as soon as I started at Royal Melbourne Hospital. Wow, well, that's that's a and baptism by fire, isn't it? It was, and you know, I, I had grown. I was in an all female family. Oh, really? Uh, and I'd gone to a girls' boarding school. Oh and gosh! Then I, went, <laughs> then I went and did nursing and lived in a nurse's home for the first nine months, where it was all it was all females, and it, there was one floor of male nurses, and you know that wow. was half empty anyway, as you understand with such a small number of male nurses. Although we have more yeah, now, yes. But uh, I think you know when I was, I, I quickly in my training, I really liked the technology and understanding, I really focused on how could we improve what we were doing. Mm. And I ended up in intensive care and I would look after one patient mm. as an intensive care nurse. And, you know, I knew that I was, I was doing that to the best of my ability mm. and I would go home and I'd feel, you know, happy with that. But then I thought, well, you know, I only ever care for one patient, one shift, five times a week, mm. you know, there's not a lot of people that I can change, you mm. know, improve their care. You want, to, you, you want to impact more people. Yeah, so I was lucky enough to be able to get a, a couple of scholarships and I went off and did my uh, degree and then I started uh, educating. I had a lecturer's position. I was able to educate nurses and, you know, I'd be standing in a lecture theatre as we did then and you might have 400 nurses in front of you and... Be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> yes, but, you know, at that point I really loved it and I mm. thought, oh, well, I'm it impacting. Felt right. This is going out, you know, this yes. is a larger number of people. So if I do the My right thing... My help is going viral here. Yes. If I do the right thing, then I'm able to actually expand this so group that, of patients yeah. that I really wanted to improve the care of. And that was really going well. And then felt I right. started um, doing research... And I, I really thought about, well, you know, in a, when I'm doing my education, I might go off and do small groups or large lectures, but it's still, it's who you actually interact with. Mm. You're limited by your interaction. But with research, your interaction is possible to, or to reach the whole world. Mm. So mm. Yes. publishing in international journals, going to international conferences, doing podcasts, mm. doing social media, having followers on Twitter. Mm. You're able to spread the message yeah. and hopefully that Big message ripple effect. has a, a, you know, a wider audience mm. and able to make an, a difference. And I think my philosophy has always been focused on improving care. So when I'm designing something, I always have that front and centre, if I can't see a pragmatic reason for doing some research, then I don't do it. Mm. It's got to have an end point of improving care. And I started studying how people make decisions because there is a belief if you understand how people make decisions, mm. then you may well be able to improve them. Mm. And the mm, recognition and response of clinical deterioration of patients in hospitals is one of those things because of the as I said the noise and the environment mm. that nurses are working it's very easy to miss those subtle cues mm, of course so in decision making we need to then put in systems that perhaps make it impossible to ignore those cues mm. so what can we do mm. that will make it fail safe system mm. and what do you think have you had feedback in terms of like some of what those are in terms of the nurses like what's been most helpful like what do they fear the most or feel I guess what's 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 a sort of element of their job in terms of what we've been talking about where they they feel most sort of nervous like they're not hitting the mark I guess uh, look, I think there's been 
a lot of socialization of nurses in the past that's been very hierarchical okay related to related to medical doctors yeah working with um, nurses but it's also the gender issue of okay. males and females mm-hmm. so in a lot of organizations the structures are um, determined by medical staff and so we need to be able to put in organizational changes that recognize the contribution to decision making of of other people a collective with the respect due respect shown and in the deterioration area we put in we used to just have it around vital signs mm. and so until a patient had abnormal vital signs so their heart rate was racing or their breathing had slowed down to virtually nothing we could then call the medical staff and say we need to intervene here mm. but we had to wait till those signs mm. were, were showing mm-hmm. now we can call in the assistance by saying I'm concerned about this patient so it's a respect and the concern is based on those subtle things I'm worried because I don't think they're right yeah there's a subtle change you know they might have had suddenly they they are starting to show some confusion in their speech mm-hmm. they're, they're not sure where they are anymore but they've always known for the you know the week before they've always known when that they're in yeah, hospital yeah. and what day it is and yes. suddenly they're confused. They don't know where they are. It's really important for people to understand it's fabulous to be in hospital and have a really caring nurse. Mm. But it's equally as important to have a nurse that can intellectually analyse what is going on with that patient to pick up those subtle cues yeah. and to intervene and make a difference. To be so educated and also heart intuition. And mind. Yeah, that's right. And I think the heart is really where probably the the intuition comes from where it's like so the the intuition is a really interesting point yeah because we talk about female intuition yes and a lot of nurses talk about having gut feelings that's right which is intuition because mm. that's really I it think is, where but it, they don't get that from being a female or mm. being a lay person mm. they get that because they've had repeated exposure to events and patients deteriorating or you know groups of patients that have had the same diagnosis yeah. and how they then proceed with their trajectory of illness. Right. So they get it from repeated exposure. So all of a sudden they really they've had so much exposure that it becomes their routine way of they they unconsciously are taking in information mm. and then making decisions. Mm. Whereas when you come across something that's very unusual, yeah, even with a patient that that's had the same, you know, still had perhaps admission because of a cardiac reason or you know heart attack, uh, they can still present differently, and that will slow down someone's decision making, and they will have to bring in more information in order to analyse it to make the correct decision of mm. how to proceed. So the the heart, I always like to think of the heart as the kindness part of it the kindness part yes you know it's where you show empathy the emotional yeah, intelligence yeah. of something that's going on and truth and yes and and then trying to you know look after someone as you would like to be looked after or mm. your father was looked after you know mm. that's that's the way people come into hospital they you know if the people talk about their experience is often based on the, the caring mm. aspect that they get yes but you can have a very, very caring nurse who makes the mistakes. So it's important of to have... Of course, have, we're humans. Yes, but the mistakes, if they're not putting the jigsaw pieces together, that could have detrimental consequences mm-hmm. for mm-hmm. someone. Mm-hmm. So it is important to have both the heart, mm-hmm. the kindness, the empathy, mm-hmm. but also the mind, the intellect, the decision-making, the critical thinking that can recognise, assimilate information and then make a decision on how to proceed. But also the blend of the two. And like, and exactly. How do you, like, in, in, as you said before, you know, the, in the past there's been issues with sort of gender hierarchy and all that sort of stuff, and I, I guess in people feeling empowered to sort of share the, the information that you're saying, your research is saying we need to, you know, on both sides of the fence, patient and um, health professional, 
be able to recognise and speak up. Um, uh, if I'm like, if I'm a nurse, I'm on the, the basic level of you know what. There's always going to be a hierarchy as, mm. as such, but hopefully a more positive one these days. If I then need to go to my my next up, and I all I've got is my gut tells me something's escalating here, but I can't pinpoint an example that's related to vital signs. Am I? Is my senior now? going to be or do they need to be more educated to say I accept what you're saying I don't think you'd step forward if you if you didn't feel something even though I don't have the facts to back that up it's literally my my instinct so that's a really interesting question because we know that when people have good relationships the team have good relationships communication I would know that if Amber came to me Mm. Tracy Mm and said, I'm worried about this person. I I do know how you practice Mm. and that you wouldn't come to me unless there was something that was happening. Yes. My response would be, okay, let's go and look at the patient and review that. But also it's about, it's from my experience, I can then say to you, okay, so what sort of things are you noticing And, and try and draw out what it is that you've noticed. Articulate why, so why, I've, why I've come there to will that be things. There'll be something. There will be something. So it might be, look, um, she's, you know, Amber's become very um, ruddy in the face, yes. flushed. She's getting warm, but I've taken her temperature and it's not yet abnormal. Yeah. But I can see something's not right. Yes. Or it might be that, you know, the the person starts slurring their speech or some mm-hmm, of those little mm-hmm. things. So the person that you've gone to mm. should be able to go back and, and would should go back and assess with you. But draw and try it out and of draw, me a bit. Yeah, draw and yeah. try and work it out. And, you know, I think if nurses are aware that, uh, you know, that's why we teach so much or spend so much time teaching communication mm. now because it's so important well, great, yeah. to actually be able to articulate that. So when I did my training, I would tell the senior nurse, yeah. who was also a student, maybe only a year extra time than I would, who then might tell the, the new nurse that's just got their registration wearing their brand new white uniform, yeah. historically as they did, then that person would then, you know, it was such a... Uh, so much steps a linear to get to hierarchy, yeah. which really delays it. Yeah, and that's, big time, big time. And that's some other research that we've shown. Yeah, that uh, we've compared the research in private hospitals where, you know, there were there's at one level less hierarchy from medical staff because they don't have junior doctors on the wards. Mm-hmm. So the nurses would report directly to the consultant who could make a decision quicker. Mm if they could get onto them. <laughs> um, but in that situation, you know, it it's, could potentially speed up the decision-making, whereas in a public hospital, the hierarchy is such that the nurse will report usually to the very most junior medical doctor who may have even just arrived on the ward. Yeah, who's still who's, slightly got who, training wheels on. Who, who hasn't areas. even been out of university a month mm. and they're making decisions. Um, and so then they will go to the person above them, uh, who's the registrar, who then, you know, if it's still not able to solve the problem, will then go to the so consultant. So time's still being lost, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, you know, we have to be able to... And that's the other thing with these medical emergency team calls now. We're not only putting in what are the criteria for calling, but also time limits. Mm. So if someone doesn't respond in a certain oh, okay. time limit. So if I don't ring you back and I'm your senior... Yes, you can go to the next level. Okay. So, you know, yeah. these are the system changes that have occurred and these have all been happening... Is this through your, directly through, through your research or various no, these studies? No, this is various studies. Uh, you know, we've been... We've just finished a an NHNMRC-funded study... Can you say NH and NH? So National Health and Medical Research Council, which is our peak body for funding medical research in Australia. And we have been able to work closely with nursing staff and Mm. getting them to 
recognise not the subtle changes but also the vital signs and yeah. that escalation. But we've also worked with them on, on how they communicate with people and who they communicate to right? in order to make it happen faster. Yeah. And, you know, our um, results are just being finalised at the moment but the preliminary results look are looking quite good for preventing um, these areas where there is a breakdown in communication because of the systems yes but also empowering nurses enough to you know go the next level yeah um, challenge thinking because sometimes if you're working with the most junior medical staff and it's reported to them they don't recognize the importance of the information they're being given Mm. so can just sit on it so it's important in the communication Mm. that the nurse is able to stress that importance and also, and also, you know, informing. And that's why a lot of nurses go to senior nurses because they don't hold back in then mm. addressing, mm. The, you know, working with the consultants or mm. other levels of medical staff because they are experienced and, and they recognise, you know, they've been exposed to these events of course, so often. That's so right. they, they the recognise is there. the urgency. Yeah. So they will say, oh no, we need to get onto that. Yeah. You can't say, come back in four hours yeah. and I'll, I'll check it out. That's not good enough. We've got to call the consultant now. Yeah. So that's the kind of thing where we're trying to work with the, the systems. Researchers. and the yeah. yeah. So, But look, the, the, this is a, a wonderful story of change in practice mm. and in systems that has been really well supported by research, changing a whole system. Mm. You know, it's it's... Shows the impact of research. Yeah, stop, it's, it's it? an amazing story. And the Australian Commission of Safety and Quality in Healthcare has recently done a review in looking at how the standard that they put in place back in 2011, mm. now it's, you know, at 2018 they did the evaluation and yeah. how positive it was looking on really? how we'd, we'd made those hospitals safer because of these And systems. you're seeing the data, the, the, yes. the figures of... Um, people coming back or things escalating and not being able to temper that have gone down. Yes, yes. We're trying to, very much you can start seeing the improvements. That's awesome. So we're seeing particularly people are not dying in hospital from cardiac arrests, which is the end point of mm. someone not recognising what's going on. And, the you know, the the graph looks very much going downwards in, is it, in and, improving. And in the space of how long was that? Six the, years, did you say? So? Um, well, since the, the – these this study, this yeah. type of work, has been um, going since 1990. About 1995, the first Australian study was published. I see, yeah. So it is – you know, we're looking at yeah, over, well over 20, 20 years of yeah, work. Yeah, yeah. But in that time where, you know – a lot of people have been saved when you look mm, at the numbers mm. of 11 million going into hospital every year at this point. And just we have to finish now, but um, I think, I mean, there's obviously many, many reasons why uh, this this research and these changes are profoundly wonderful for society and all of us individually. But I think anything that um, as an end result means that people can die or have more time at home that's big Mm. because why nobody I mean it's that's and people don't you know we don't have enough discussions about how do we make sure that that's not us or it's not our loved ones that Mm. ends up you know dying in 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 hospital Mm. you know as much as there's wonderful people working there it's not where most people want to be I don't think is it yeah thank you for the wonderful work you do And I've really loved this chat. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thanks for joining in the conversation with us about our healthcare system. If you'd like more information on any of the topics or researchers in this series, simply head to iht.deakin.edu.au.